Good evening. And welcome to worship on this solemn evening of Ash Wednesday. We begin with the ashes, reminding one another that we are from the earth. God created us, but because of our sin, we will die, and our bodies will again return to earth. But we end this service with Holy Communion, where we gather at the table of our Lord as invited guests. And there we are given not only forgiveness, but life eternal in Jesus. I invite you then to prepare your hearts and minds to be in this solemn time, but also a time of worship and joy and gratitude. If you find tonight very meaningful and helpful in your spiritual walk, we want to let you know that there's also a prayer room that will be available through the entire Lenten series, um, through the weeks leading up to Easter and beyond. It's in the south entrance. You'll see a prayer room designed with an altar, a cross, and solitude for prayer. But for right now, I invite you to please stand. And we join in our prayer of humiliation. We come with a deep sense of our guilt before you, O Lord. We plead but the mercy and your love of Jesus, our Savior. We know that we are dust and have no power of ourselves. We have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. But God will return, confessing our sins and renouncing them, praying for grace to be faithful and true. With the help of your Holy Spirit, May we no more be led by our passions and evil desires. Through your word and sacraments, help us in this season of Lent to overcome failings and give all our powers of mind and body to you for your service. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. We join in our hymn. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart. The fasting, the and the Lord, your hearts, and not your 
Return to the Lord your God, for He is gracious and merciful. We kneel or sit. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. O Lord, you are righteous and your law is perfect. I confess that I have not walked in your ways, nor kept your statutes in my heart. My words, actions, and deeds have strayed from your paths of love for you and for my neighbor. Forgive me, O Lord, and cleanse me from my sin. Teach me your precepts and lead me in following them. Hear the good news. Through the atoning sacrifice of Christ Jesus, God has forgiven your iniquity and remembers your transgressions no more. He washes you clean, making you pure in heart to walk again in His righteous ways. Go now in peace and joy to follow wholeheartedly in the precepts of the Lord. Seek Him with all your heart, for God has redeemed you and claimed you as His own. You belong to Him who is faithful and just, who cleanses you from sin. Please stand. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, as we begin our Lenten pilgrimage, we come before you in need of mercy and grace, marked with ashes as a sign of our mortality and penance. Lead us to true repentance. Draw near to us that we may draw near to you. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our crucified and risen Savior. Amen. You may be seated.
the Old Testament reading, Exodus chapter 20. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness or anything that is in heaven above or is that in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make the, take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or female servant, or your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that the, your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. This is the word of the Lord. Our second reading is not an epistle, but the longest psalm in the Old Testament. We're going to be looking at each part of this psalm through our weeks of Lenten journey. I'm going to invite you to read it with me, the first eight verses. Together, blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong, but walk in his ways. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then I shall not be put to shame. Having my eyes fixed on all your commandments, I will praise you with an upright heart. When I learn your righteous rules, I will keep your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me. This is the word of the Lord. We stand to sing the verse. Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 22nd chapter. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. One of them, a lawyer, asked Jesus a question to test him. Teacher, which is the greatest, great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. This is the gospel of our Lord.
Jesus, thank you. Thank you that we are here with you. Fill us with your spirit. Enliven our minds, our souls, that we may love you with all that we are. We ask this in your name. Amen. Please be seated. As I mentioned, that we will now begin a sermon series. It's entitled, The Way of Love. Each week, we will be looking at a simple explanation of the Ten Commandments. Now, before you groan or think, oh man, I don't know, (laughs) this isn't designed to be heavy. The Lord Jesus is the one here to carry the burden. Our job, by the Spirit, is to listen to take these words into our hearts, to really consider them, and by the Spirit, put them into action. Because these words, while they are law, it is the word that the Spirit uses to bring us love. It is the way of love that the first commandment be kept. You shall have no other gods before me. You You will remember from your small catechism the smallest meaning uh, and explanation. This, this was the easy one, right? We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. It's one thing to memorize the words. It is another thing for the Spirit to bring them to life. And that has been my prayer, that God would give us this time, that He would He would work in us, not only through the words of my mouth, but also in your behavior, your actions, that you would be drawn ever closer to God, that you would love Him in a new way, that you would be be brought to a new place in your life where old sins, once coddled, once excused, once ignored, would be seen for what they are. And there confessed and repented to change the way you think and act, to be led by Jesus into the way of love, the way of love for God. Now, if you have a small catechism, you got a big one too. And since we're, we're ready for something more than one sentence, I would, I would like to share with you a little bit of Luther's large catechism and what he had to say about this commandment. For Luther said, a God means that from which you are to expect all good, in which we are able to take refuge in distress. So to have a God is nothing more than trusting and believing Him with the heart. I know this is a Lutheran talking. With your heart. It's one thing to know intellectually that there is a God and that He should be obeyed and that He should be God. It is another thing with all of your heart, your wholehearted devotion to Him. And it it cannot be forced. You can't make yourself love anything or anyone. And it is not to be confused with desires. We love chocolate because we want to eat it. We love people simply because of who they are. They are that person in my life that I have made a conscious decision that my heart is open to them and that my will wills their good. I desire good things for them and that I am working good things for them. So to have a God is to have that in your life, that being, that person in which you expect all good from, and you take refuge when life is unmanageable, untenable. So having a God is nothing more than this wholehearted devotion. Luther went on to say, but confidence and faith of the heart make both a God and an idol. Yes, you can have this kind of relationship with the true and living God, but that is the exception, not the rule. Our hearts, 
long for anything but the true God. Our hearts look to those things that are created, not the Creator, to give us refuge, comfort, delight, all things that are good. Luther went on to say that if your faith and trust is right, then your God is also true. Now, I say that whatever you set your heart on and put your trust in, that is truly your God. So what are our idols? What are our fake gods? Because those are the things that this law is going after. It's mind-boggling that in the desert, after being delivered from slavery in Egypt, Moses went up the mountain just a little bit too long, and everyone decided, you know what, we need another God. And so they made the golden calf. It's mind-boggling until you realize, oh, that's what I do. I'm always putting something that I can see, experience, have control over. That becomes my God. And so when we look at those things that are normal idols, they're always good things. They're they're things that, that everyone else would go, well, yeah, you should hold that in high esteem. A pastor had a young couple in his office, and they were wanting so terribly to have children. But try as they may, it just wasn't happening. And they were cut so to the heart, and they were so frustrated, and they were angry, and they were angry at God. They were there in the pastor's office. And the pastor, as he he felt the anger and the frustration and and the borderline, I'm ready just to walk away from the Lord, he put to the couple this question, is having children, is it become your idol, the thing? that you look to for good and joy and delight that will fulfill you, satisfy you, keep you safe. The words hit home. Even as I look at my own life and I, as I look at the trajectory of where I'm going, you know, I'm going to retire someday and want to make sure that I'll have enough money to go to the long-term care, you know, okay, so we, we got all that projected out and it's like, you know what, that looks good. My trust is in that bank account, because if it wasn't there, how would I take care of myself? How would I take care of my wife? Oh, wait, wait. What's your God again? Who's your God? You see, these are good things, taking care of people, having children. It's it's a good thing to want to be known and, and, and being good at your job, being affirmed at that, but if it becomes your identity... If you're not you unless you're doing what you do, you've placed it into the idle spot. If you must be anything, if you must have anything, there is your idol. The best way, though, to find your idols are to look at the things that you cannot live without. Like if you lost this, you really would seriously consider questioning God, maybe even checking out of life altogether. You, you have to have this. Now, as you think about your idols, you, we also need to hear God as he stood on the mountain uh, through his servant Moses, and he gave the Ten Commandments, and he warned the people that I, the Lord your God, I am a jealous God. That's very unusual for us to hear God talk this way. What, what does he mean by that I am a jealous God? I'm just going to start off by saying it means exactly what you think it means. Emotional, ready to go to battle, ready to fight for you. Whereas our jealousy is for selfish ends that I may have what I want, God's jealousy is that you may be His. His jealousy is the same kind of jealousy that is a good thing in marriage, that We don't share. We don't share our bodies. We don't share emotions with another person. Not in the way husband and wife does. No sharing allowed. 
There's no such thing as an open marriage. That's a non-marriage. So it is with God. There's no such thing as you have your idols and you have me. It's one or the other. And he's a jealous God. And he's coming after you. Not to destroy you, but to destroy the idols. As you think about your heart, think about your life. In these, in these weeks to come, and even right now, right now is the moment to examine your heart in light of the commandment that you shall have no other God. This moment isn't simply to hear, but to be with your God. And there, consider your heart by the Spirit. And so we're going to have these moments in these weeks to come, in which I'm going to invite you right now, whatever posture you're most comfortable in, either to, to kneel, get the kneeler back out, or to simply sit and we're going to be quiet. And I'm going to invite you to pray to the Lord that the Holy Spirit would help you to see what is grievous inside of you. What needs to be confessed. And then, having had that moment, and it's going to be a moment of silence. It's going to be a moment that's going to be awkward if you're not praying and asking the Lord to examine your heart. And then, confessing our sins. You're not going to do this out loud. This is you and your God. Confessing your sin before God. And then, asking the Spirit to, re to work in your heart repentance. I mean, it's one thing to know you got a problem. It's another thing what to do with it. And you're not strong enough to get rid of your idols. It is only by the work of Jesus, the one who has gone the way of crucifixion, who's gone into death and out of death, that he might take you with him and offer you purity, forgiveness, and life. Not because you've confessed, not because you've repented, but because of what he's done for you, and it's now available to you. So we're going to spend time confessing and asking the Lord to lead us in repentance, and then I'm going to proclaim to you the most very good news. So get comfortable. Kneel, sit, and let us pray. Having confessed your sin, now pray that the Spirit would lead you in repentance.
O Lord, your spirit is among us. You are here calling us to a life with you of love, of fidelity, of purity, a life which you made possible through Jesus, his blood shed on the cross. Hear the prayer of your people, our cry for mercy, repentance, and give us faith to believe this good news. We are yours. Sing with me. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. He answers prayer. He answers prayer. He answers prayer. He answers prayer. He's so good to me. I love him so. I love him so. I love him so. I love him so. He's so good to me. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. Amen. You may be seated. You may remain seated as we confess our faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and I look for you. Holy Christian and Apostolic Church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. You may remain seated as we lift up our prayers to the Lord. Have mercy on us, O God, according to your steadfast love. In your abundant mercy, Blot out our transgressions for the sake of your Son, Jesus, who was crucified for our sins and raised for our justification. Preserve the proclamation of his cross among us. Guard your church from every false teaching that might delight or that we desire, but leave us lost. Lord, in your mercy. Look graciously on your church and this congregation specifically. Renew us during this potential season, to strive against the desires of the flesh, 
to grow in the joy of your salvation and to look in love and service toward our neighbor. Lord, in your mercy. Behold in mercy all who are sick, who suffer, and who rejoice. Be with all expectant mothers, all whose work is dangerous, the unemployed, those near death, and those who mourn. Comfort us who are dust and must remember that we return to dust. Give us the promise of the resurrection in Jesus. Lord, in your mercy. Grant repentance as we come to the Lord's table. Let us recognize the enormity of our sins, but also the even bigger grace that you cover us with. Let us come to this table, receiving Christ, receiving strength for our faith and life to live in love. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us come forward now with our tithes and our offerings and attendance cards. If you haven't already done so, please bring them forward to the front to the offering plates. Please stand. Look what love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, for that is what we are. And as children, here at the table of our Lord, let us prepare our hearts and minds. We pray, blessed are you, O Lord God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us. You have given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. At your command, Abraham prepared to offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice on the mountain. Yet in mercy, you provided a ram as a substitute. We give you thanks that on Calvary, you spared not your only son, but sent him to to offer his life as a ransom for many. As we eat and drink his body and blood, grant us, like Abraham our father, to trust in your promise now fulfilled in Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night on which he was betrayed, took bread. And after he had offered thanks, he broke the bread and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, after the supper, he took the cup. 
And after he had offered thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Please stand. <clears throat> and now the true body and blood of your Lord and Savior, strengthen and preserve you in true faith to life everlasting. Depart from his table with peace and with joy. Amen. Having received this gift, we return thanks. We do give thanks to you, Almighty God. You, you do love us. You care for us, and you have fed us here. We pray now, having been to this table, that you would strengthen our faith in you and our fervent love for one another. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord, let, let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give to you his peace.